Hi guys, we're now up to the last lesson of this module, The World Communicates. We're going to be talking about the internet, a tool for communication and for the sending of pictures of cats. So, we know uh, from our studies on analog and digital signals that analog signals can lose fidelity when they're transmitted long distances, right? They can become distorted by interference, leading to pictures like this on a TV. So this can make the signal unrecognizable. In the worst case, it can reduce the signal to static, which is just random data without any form. So for this reason, instead of using analog data, we tend to use digital information to, for transferring. And the reason is that it's harder to lose fidelity with a digital, uh, digital recording when you're transmitting it. Sure, you've lost a bit of fidelity because you now have a digital signal instead of an analog one. But once you have the digital signal, its fidelity shouldn't really change much when you transmit it. The internet provides a way of transmitting digital data very quickly and all over the world using the telephone communications. So we have a huge network of computers connected by things like ethernet cables, uh, telephone wires, and optical fiber cables, which of course we learned about when we were talking about total internal ref uh, reflection. And we can also use things like wireless communications to get things like satellite links. Uh, computers, in order to talk to each other or communicate with each other, use a series of protocols like the hypertext transfer protocol. So these allow the computers to uh, request information from each other in a certain way and to send that information back in a certain way. And so it's, it's a little bit like a language of computers speaking to each other or a series of steps that they go through in order to get information from each other. Uh, the protocols will tend to allow for corrupt data because even though uh, analog signals uh, tend to be more affected by interference, digital signals can be, interfect, uh, can be affected by interference too. But computers are able to detect whether a digital signal is good and working fine or bad and has been interfered with. And if it receives a bad signal, when well, it's been corrupted by interference, it can send back a request to send that signal again. And it can keep doing this until it gets an uncorrupted version of the signal. That's exactly the same as the signal that you started off with. Computers use a modem, which might look something like this, in order to turn the digital signals of the computer information into analog signals, which can be sent through phone lines. So consequently, because phone lines are controlled by uh, telephone companies like Telstra, a lot of the internet plans that you can get are also associated with big phone companies, like Telstra's Big Pond, for example. Now, in the past, if you wanted to connect to the internet, you had to send the digital signals uh, straight to a modem, and the modem would turn them into sound information, which would then be sent through telephone lines. We can see here an old handset from a telephone placed on top of a modem so that the sounds that the modem produces are sent straight through the phone lines. Of course, uh, this technology we grew out of pretty fast and by the 80s and 90s we had uh, small modem devices which acted like uh, a modem and a phone at the same time. All you needed to do was disconnect your ordinary phone and put the modem in instead. So this is what we call a dial-up connection. And so if you're using a dial-up connection, it sort of replaces your telephone connection and information is sent through that, uh, through that set of signals. So the telephone companies would charge the user based on how long the, 
telephone call was. Except rather than being a telephone call to someone else to speak to them, it would be a telephone, well, a modem call rather than a telephone call to an internet service provider who, who would then send back the information that was requested. Today though, we don't use dial-up, we use broadband connections. And the setup for a broadband connection might look something like this. You can see that the phone is still working and operational right next to the modem. If we have a broadband connection, it means that we can use both the phone and the modem at the same time, which I'm sure you'll agree is very convenient. Uh, instead of being charged for the length of a call, because the modem can be always on, we're instead charged for the amount of data that is sent and received through the connection. So if you go to your computer and you type in a web page like Google, for example, then your computer will send a signal to the computer that has Google on it, which might be millions of, uh, well not millions, thousands of kilometers away on, somewhere on the other side of the world, right? And so that's uh, given here by the request arrow coming out of the laptop. So the server will receive the request, process it using a protocol, perhaps the hypertext transfer protocol, and based on what the request has in it, it will take uh, the web pages that it contains and send a response. So both the request and the response uh, will go through many different devices. It's not just a simple connection plugging in one computer to the Google computer. Otherwise, that's not really the internet, is it? It's a local area network. So if we want to send something to Google, we need to send a signal across the internet. And that means that we're going to have to take many more steps than just this. So first of all, the data is sent to your modem, right? And converted to a signal that can be sent through telephone lines. So it'll travel through the phone lines until the signal reaches your ISP, that is, internet service provider. That's the person who you pay for, for internet. Once it's reached that, it'll travel through a whole bunch of carriers. Carriers are simply devices which will receive a request for a web page and then pass that request on. So it sort of carries the signal onto the next part of the network. We can see here a trace of uh, how far a signal is moving. Most of these entries in the middle are the signal passing through various different carriers. Right at the bottom here, it starts to reach carriers close to its destination. Finally, once uh, the signal arrives at the destination, the server that it uh, arrives at can interpret the signal, figure out what to send back, and then send that response. So, uh, once the response gets back to the computer in the same way that uh, the request went, the modem will translate the signal into uh, computer-readable data. This will consist of ones and zeros, which can then be translated into letters, for example, as we can see at the top here. And a browser, something like Mozilla Firefox or Google Chrome, is a program on your computer which can turn this raw text and ones and zeros data into formatted data. That is, data that looks nice and pretty, right? Something like this picture on the bottom with a proper font and color and backgrounds and images and things like that. So, that's the end of the theory. Uh, in this section, we've covered exactly what the internet is and a little bit about how it works. So, let's go on to some questions to test your knowledge. Question 16. Which of these options best describes the internet? Is it a series of tubes, an encyclopedia, a collection of websites, or a group of networked computers? 
Well, let's go through our options, shall we? The first one says a series of tubes. Now, I seem to recall someone describing the internet like that before, but it's not really very accurate. You could say that the information uh, being carried across the internet has to travel through a series of telephone cables or a series of carriers, but that's not really a series of tubes. Is it then an encyclopedia? Uh, of course, many people like to use the internet to gather information on different re uh, resources, right? So it's a little bit like an encyclopedia. But the internet as a whole isn't an encyclopedia. It can just contain an amount of encyclopedic knowledge. You might even be able to find an encyclopedia within the internet. But the internet itself is not, in fact, an encyclopedia. So C looks uh, promising, a collection of websites. But in fact, this isn't quite right either. Remember that, remember that um, the internet, as well as being used to access websites, can also do things like send email, or send instant messages, or send uh, video and audio communication. So it can't just be websites. It's got to be something more than that, although there are a lot of websites on the internet. D says a group of networked computers, and that, at first that seems a little underwhelming. But in fact, D is the correct answer. All the different computers on the internet, and there are millions of them, uh, will either be a client sending requests, or a server receiving requests and sending responses. So every time you access a website, your computer is requesting data on a very distant computer that might be on the other side of the world. And that distant computer will have to send it back before you receive anything on your own computer. Every time you send an email, uh, it's going from your computer through the internet to some central server that determines who it's sent by and where it goes. Then that central server will take the email and send it to its recipient. So in all these cases, we're not just sending something from computer to computer. We're sending something through a huge group of networked computers that are all communicating with each other. Question 17. What types of data can be used to communicate on the internet? Well, remember, what does the internet send? Analog or digital data? Well, digital, right? So anything that can be represented as digital data, ones and zeros, can be sent through the net. So can we only send numbers? No. If we take a wave, we can take samples and turn the analog data into digital data. It turns out that we can do the same thing with pictures. We can divide a picture into lots and lots of little slices called pixels and represent each pixel by a number. Once we have a number for each pixel, we can send the whole sequence of numbers as a binary number through the internet. So some some ways that we can use to communicate over the internet might be through text. Uh, and of course, each letter can just be represented by a different number. By images, where we can represent each pixel as a different number. Or we can use more advanced algorithms to decrease the size of the image file. We can use videos, which take up lots of, uh, uh, lots of data. But of course, if we use compression algorithms or decrease the sampling rate, we can make them a lot smaller. Or finally, we can use sound, whether it's just over a headset or with a video or audio recording. Question 18. What transformations does text contain on a website go through before it can be displayed on a screen? Now, we have a few transformations here. Let's go through them. First of all, we convert the text data to ones and zeros, right? We reduce the text data to numbers, and those numbers to uh, base two numbers, which consists of just on and off pulses. Then we can encode that into a signal that's sent through a modem over telephone lines. When it arrives at the destination, then we take the telephone line signals, turn them back into ones and zeros, turn those back into text data, and have the computer on the other end receive and decode those signals. Right? Once we have that, 
we can just uh, send it back. So the, the text will be sent back through the signal, uh, through the modem and through the phone lines and back to the computer that originally sent the request. And once the computer has received the response, it can take the ones and zeros, turn that back into text data, uh, take that text data, turn it into a code that can be read by a web browser. And then the web browser can take that raw text data and produce pretty text data. And that's responsible for, of course, the layout and the color of anything that you might see in a website. Although it's worth pointing out that most web browsers have an option to allow you to view the source of any web page. And if you use that option, then you'll be able to see all of the raw data that the web browser receives. Question 19. A certain internet connection can transmit data at 30 kilobytes per second. If a headset encodes voice samples with two bytes per sample, what's the maximum sampling rate at which the headset can transmit? Right? If we transmit too many samples per second, then we'll be trying to transmit more than the internet connection is capable of, and we'll end up getting glitches or stuttering or just a failure to transmit. All right, so let's see if we can figure this one out. How many bytes is 30 kilobytes? Well, if we say that a kilobyte is 1,000 bytes, then we have 30,000 bytes per second. So 30 kilobytes of data and 2 bytes per sample means we can send uh, 15,000 samples per second. Right, 30,000 bytes over 2 bytes per sample. And that will translate, of course, to just 15 kilohertz. Now this is about three times lower than the sampling quality of a CD. Right? That means that the fidelity is not going to be extremely high. However, it's high enough that we'll be able to uh, understand anything that is sent over the microphone. It just won't be extremely high quality sound. Question 20. Data from websites is usually sent from the server to the user in little packets. Each packet contains a certain amount of data and uh, a position where it matches up in the packets. So it might be a, an identifier saying this is which packet I am. Now the thing is if we're sending both a payload of data and information about that data, sometimes called metadata, then we're actually sending more information than we need to. Right? We're sending a payload plus an extra bit that's hanging on for no apparent reason. So why do we send this extra bit? Why do we send the packet's location in the finished sequence instead of just the finished sequence? Can you think of a reason? Well, the answer is, of course, that internet connections aren't perfect. Can you see what I mean? Data will sometimes become corrupted or lost when it's sent through telephone lines, right? There might be an error transmitting uh, a message from a, one carrier to the next carrier so that the next carrier never gets the signal and doesn't know what to pass on. In that case, uh, the signal will never arrive. The other possibility is that the signal will arrive, but it will be all garbled and corrupted, and we won't know what it contains. So that means that if we sent all the data at once, we either wouldn't receive it, or we'd receive a mangled version of it, unless we were very lucky. If we send it in packets, then that means that if a packet gets lost or corrupted, then we can just ask again for that particular packet. There are enough packets being sent through that some of them will turn in unharmed, and each time uh, you send in another request for packets, uh, you'll get more of them coming in unharmed. Eventually, we'll be able to get all the packets uncorrupted and unlost, and we can just assemble them all and produce the final piece of data. And that, of course, is why we don't send uh, a huge 
video file or a huge image file all at once. We send it in little pieces. Right, so that's the end of the uh, questions, which means we are now at the end of both the lesson and the end of the module. Congratulations. So we've now finished going through all of the world communicates. We've learned about how different sorts of waves work and how they interact with each other. And most recently, we've learned about the difference between analog and digital data and how digital data can be sent through the internet. Good luck for your exams. Thank you.